First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you all here tonight for uh, what will be our last CPD for this year. Um, next CPD will probably be uh, in February next year. Um, we've certainly got the largest audience that we've had for the year, and that probably reflects on the importance of the subject uh, and the speaker for tonight. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome Professor John Abbott here tonight. <laughs> You may not be aware of it, but he's the only professor left on the campus. Um, every professor's up at Port Douglas at the moment on about their fifth glass of wine right now, I'd say, and um, Professor Abbott's taken the time to come and join us tonight, so I'd like to thank him for doing that. <laughs> um, this evening, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce from my hometown of Adelaide, uh, Dr Liz Coates, who's a special needs dentist at the Adelaide Dental Hospital. Uh, Liz completed a master's degree in oral pathology in 1998 and has been extensively involved in the area of infection control, um, being the chairperson of AMADA from 1996 to 1998. Um, before calling on Liz, um, I've got to first of all correct the, an incorrect statement that was made on our advertisement. Um, we did say that Liz was the, uh, the current chairperson of the ADA Federal Infection Control Committee. In fact, uh, Liz was the uh, vice chairperson for six years and was the chairperson for another six years, but the current chairperson is Professor Laurie Walsh. So right now, I'd like to welcome Liz Coates. Please welcome Liz. Uh, hello, people in Townsville. This is the first time I've ever... Um, uh, can you see me waving? Hopefully you can. Uh, I've ever tele-lectured, so this is very special for me. You can tell I'm from the south. For starters, I'm absolutely drenched. My hair is wet because I got caught in the rain and I didn't have an umbrella. And plus, I have a jacket on because I'm from the south. So we can get rid of the jacket. That's the first thing we'll do. Um, and I'll now start to talk about uh, some infection control stuff. Uh, thank you, Bob, for the very generous introduction. I actually think most people are probably here tonight because it's raining and there's not much else to do. It's the rainy season. Um, but having said that, it is an important subject and there are hopefully a couple of things you can take away from tonight's uh, talk. Before I go on to the new board and the new infection control guidelines um, that have just been developed and the ones from last year that were developed. I'm going to take you on a bit of a history lesson and it never ceases to amaze me being an old, old dentist uh, that when I mention the name Kimberly Vigalis, uh, often I just get this blank look people sort of say, like happened with squadron leader Thomas uh, earlier today, and I thank him for his assistance in the clinic in various matters. Um, but I said, oh, yes, it all started with Kimberly Begalis, and he looked and said, who was she? And um, I said, she was a patient uh, in Florida in 1984. So, first a history lesson. Why is infection control in dentistry so important? Why are you actually here? What's, what's brought you here today? And I see some of you smiling, and that's because you can see the ad that was done for the AIDS campaign back in the 80s, and this was the Grim Reaper. And it was one of the very successful ad campaigns, and not only did it probably uh, make people think twice about having unsafe sex, we probably got a drop in birth rate corresponding to this period. Um, one thing about people is they will always have sex. So it didn't last very long. Uh, but as an ad campaign, it was intriguing. People were dying right around the world from AIDS. I had a patient came in 
In around about 1983, I was working in a small suburban practice in Adelaide, and this bloke walked in, a young chap, and he said, I have HIV, um, can you treat me? And I said, I honestly don't know. I said, I think you have to go to the dental hospital. I had no idea. That's in 1983. Back in 1983, my generation of dentists were still worried about genital herpes and whether people were going to come into our surgeries with herpes and spread it that way. And we were worried about this other problem that had arisen, hepatitis B. Suddenly dentists could catch hepatitis B from patients. And this brand new disease called AIDS, it was, it was mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. They started to say, well, it's all down to homosexuals. And then we found that people with haemophilia got the disease as well. And everyone started to wonder if there was a specific gene in haemophilia that maybe was responsible, and then, of course, they realised it was blood-borne. Amongst all of this, what happened was that six patients in Florida of a dentist called Dr. Acer all got HIV. And the virus was matched to Dr. Acer's virus. It was without doubt there had been a direct transmission in his practice of HIV to six patients, one of whom was Kimberly Begalis. And we became headlines as a profession right around the world. The patients, well, let's show you. This is one of the stories from the time. And this was in 1991, it was in the San Francisco Chronicle and it sort of said that Kimby Lee Begalis is on her deathbed, she's dying. Um, goes on to say that 100,000 people have died from AIDS in America. But Begalis is the first one to die because she got her teeth cleaned. Think about it. All of you who never heard of Kimberly Begalis, suddenly people are saying, whoa, we're not going to the dentist. You can get AIDS at the dentist. So. The next thing that happened was damage control. That was pretty good damage control. The American Dental Association, not ours, uh, came out and said that Asa didn't wear gloves, he didn't sterilise his instruments, he was unbelievably lax. Well, I can tell you in 1983 that lots of people didn't sterilise their instruments, lots of people didn't wear gloves. It was not standard precautions in 1983. This was damage control. And this is a statement that was written way after the event happened. She died at 23, incidentally. Uh, we had no adequate treatments back then, and it was pretty much all tragic. Um, the American Dental Association recommended that patients start to be their own watchdogs. And that's why you're sitting here. Because if you want to help people and if you want to actually give them uh, good oral care, you have to win their trust. And the only thing the patient is capable of judging you on is actually your infection control. So if you are seen not to wear a mask, if you are seen not to wear gloves, if you are seen not to decontaminate your hands, the patient is looking for that. They've got no damn idea at all if you can do a good resin filling or in Don's case, if you can come up with good orthodontic uh, wiring. They have no idea about that. But they jolly well know if Don doesn't put his gloves on. Okay, so in 1987, dentistry had to start doing some dramatic things in infection control. And it was all just ad hoc. We threw together a whole lot of things that we thought might help. Um, some of the stuff we threw together was based on science. Um, even things like Joseph Lister with antisepsis, we knew that some of that worked. People proposed barriers and most dentists were wearing gloves, but it was more about protecting ourselves than protecting patients. But the appearance of infection control, above all else, it was risk management, it became important. This is the instructions. I ran an AIDS clinic, or I still run an HIV clinic in the dental hospital at Adelaide, and I started in 1989 and I'm still running the clinic. 
Um, oh, sorry, I'll correct that. I am still working in the clinic. These were my instructions. We had a little isolated room. We got a linen bag. We put a wet liner inside the linen bag. We wore one gown, then a green gown, theatre gown over that. We used to wear surgical overshoes and a cap. And we had a list of things we had to do. Then, the next instruction, you had to, quote, clear the cubicle of all removable furniture and equipment, including rubbish bin, tissue box, intercom receiver, I can't even remember what that was, and paper towels. We had to take the paper towels out of the room before we treated someone with HIV. We used to tape over the spittoon so that it cannot be used. Now, I, I think that was about the only thing in this list that was a really good idea. Who wants someone, uh, no matter what they, they may or may not be infected with, but all numbed up, after a scale and clean, blood everywhere, spitting on your floor? Who wants that? It's, it's, the spittoon is, is not a nice little thing in dentistry, and that's my personal opinion, but I digress. So all of this had to happen, and then when the patient finished... I had a list of things that I had to do. I had to take off, double glove of course, was mandatory. I had to take off the outer pair of gloves, then I could do my cap and mask, then take my glasses off, then I could take the green gown off, then, quote, one boot off and place the foot outside the door, then the other boot and then step totally outside the room. All right? Now, I have looked after some of the people that come to my clinic for 25 years. They come in, I hug them.